Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And welcome, everybody. Today, uh, we are welcoming Margaret Gay, who is a Shintaido instructor on the East Coast of America. She's been a Shintaido instructor for some time, I believe, and she has taught uh, in America. Uh, and she, we invited her to Europe uh, a couple of years ago uh, to share with us some of her uh, movement that she's also um, uh, practices from body mind centering so we're very happy to welcome margaret we will be looking at shintaido movements through the prism of body mind centering um, i'm sure some of you don't know what body mind centering is unless you've looked it up before you came so margaret's going to take us through the development of movement um, and then we would like to talk about what we can discover about shintaido movement and particularly the Body is a Message of the Universe. This is a, a book that was issued by Shintaido of America um, uh, in the 80s, I believe. And um, it's a well-known textbook. Um, and we ponder the message, what that message might be and how we're receiving it. So, um, Margaret, can you, can you tell us something about how you found Shintaido and how you found Body Mind Centering? Sure. Um, I first found Shintaido, I, I think I was 25 or 26, and I felt like I needed, uh, well, that in general, that movement and almost any kind of movement was really helpful for me in terms of organizing myself or organizing my feelings and my mind. And I happened to see uh, a little advertisement in this local newspaper in Worcester. And it said something about, oh, community, not community-based, but non-competitive sort of martial arts. And um, so I went to a class and it was one that Joe Zawielski was leading. And afterwards my housemate said, well, what did you do? And I said, well, I have no idea. Uh, we just hopped, we hopped, like the whole time it felt like. <laughs> but I kept going back because there was something that felt really good about it. So um, I continued my study. I eventually moved to uh, Cambridge and started studying with Michael Thompson and um, a whole group that was out between Worcester and Cambridge and further points north. And eventually, I started teaching and I felt like I needed to understand just movement, just what was happening in terms of movement more because I was seeing things happen for myself, but also what was happening for people in the class with the movements that we were doing. And I just didn't, I just felt like I needed some more. And so that became a, uh, just a question I had. And I eventually, found uh, Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen. Um, and the part that got me initially was about developmental movement. So the first year of movement, or first year of, yeah, <laughs> you get it. First year in movement. And uh, it related quite directly to what we were doing. And then as I got further into the study, it became even more relative. Um, as we started doing more Yokike practice, the pieces of body mind centering that related to that came more into focus for me also. Um, so that was the beginning for me. <laughs> so you found a real synergy between those, those two things. One thing was informing the other um, while you were yeah. experiencing them. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what was the uh, what kind of interaction was it? I don't know whether you feel that it's time to start looking at the slides now because I think it will help people understand. Uh, I I think most of us here have done Shintaido. Some of us won't have done Shintaido. Um, so it's going to be interesting for the people who've never done Shintaido to imagine what Shintaido uh, is exactly, although um, looking at the picture from the body mind from the yeah. Shintaido book you can see it comes from martial arts of course um, 
but nobody really, uh, not many people understand body mind centering or some of the ideas, uh, developmental ideas there. So um, maybe we could have a look at the slides and you can take us through those. The piece that Bonnie was um, continually, Bonnie, who is the founder of Body Mind Centering, um, was just looking at movement and consciousness and movement being a language in itself and that each language has its own patterns. She also found patterns of movement that related to ourselves and the animal kingdom and um, that was kind of the evolutionary process. So that was a piece of what we were exploring. Um, each of these patterns has their own consciousness. Each cell has its own consciousness. And um, the idea of embodiment was that there was a fuller understanding of what your perceptions were during each of these states and, and that you, like that sense of owning something. You, you owned the movement and the movement owned you, that it wasn't a separate thing. Um, and a certain mind state that came with each of them. So within that kind of base, the um, template that we use for development had um, many pieces over the years. And this is this latest form. Uh, so first there is energy before form where we talk about vibration and then entering into form and that itself having its own um, patterns. So the first one of vibration is relating to that rhythmic uh, condensing and expanding waves of the universe that, you know, if you look at the galaxy and they talk about all of the expanding uh, we are expanding as a universe, but within that expansion, there's so much condensing forces and exploding forces and um, that we're, we're a part of that, you know, that we have this expanding and condensing riding in us also. Um, and within that, there's a sense of polarity that there's a, um, and out of polarity comes magnetism and resonance and um, light waves, all of that kind of things that are properties that are unseen, but we feel them. And they're at the base of, uh, they're just at the base of life, that kind of um, property of our universe, I would say. So once we come into form, I'll just say them and then we'll, we'll look at the pictures that we have. So one, one section has to do with, um, once we come into form is states that do not have a spine. So we're the pre-vertebrate animal kingdom. And first one is cells, so cellular breathing. Um, sponges, pulsation, navel radiation, mouthing, and prespinal. And then coming into the vertebrate world is spinal movement, so head to tail, homologous movement, upper limbs or lower limbs, homolaterals, kind of one side, so right arm and right leg or left arm and left leg, so you become a sided creature and contralateral is movement that goes from uh, on a diagonal through your body. And um, okay, let, we, let's go to the next one. So we'll, we're just gonna look at each of these and where we see it in, the, in our world and then sometimes in the Shintaito world. So here in this first picture, there's a sense, scene of the universe and the, um, the cosmos and our relationship to that cosmos. Um, looking at the, the water, the drop of water and how that expands outward and resonates. Um, 
this is a place where you look at in a way um, the magnet exercises that we have or our relationship into universe into the universe where you just feel the energy of the space um, sometimes playing uh, with the energy balls something as simple as where do you put yourself in the room or who do you feel attracted to what do you go towards and away from um, that's kind of that quality of energy and vibration and um margaret is that like when uh, when we're in a dojo and we're asked to do kumite and we naturally gravitate to a kumite partner because we find some kind of synergy and, that, yeah. and then we have to work yeah. with and then we have to work with other in energies as well so that's and how do you how do you work with the energies that are not so familiar to you? And where do you sit in the room? Oftentimes people will want to sit in the same place in a room. It's like, so what is the energy of that place or something like that? Yeah. yeah. I think also of wakame where you have, you receive information beforehand. So some thing is being communicated but it's not physical. So there's, there's information that is arriving to you and you have a response. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so we can go to the next one. Okay. So the next piece is called, um, so once we come, into form, the first uh, concept is about cellular breathing and that each cell has its own consciousness, life force and vibration. And one of the qualities of this is about the fluid exchange. So there's this continual sense of expanding and condensing. Um, and when that expanding and condensing stops, either the cell has died or there's less communication to the whole. Um, one of the symbols that we've used for cellular breathing is a circle um, where everyone is equal in the circle and there's equal potential throughout that whole thing. Um, so as we sit in the circle, it has that same quality of presence that each of us is, um, present in the circle and um, can exchange that way. And the back bend is more about kind of breathing together. How do you communicate to each other through your breath? That simple exchange of touching our membranes together and letting our breathing inform each other of us, of ourselves. And in OM, I think the um, we're we're just coming, just keep coming further and further into our deeper self, to the point of nothing. So it had that resonance for me of coming further and further in, and yet that's the place of all potential. So, as with the amoeba, that can move in any different direction. It um, it, it also has that quality. Okay, next. So the next one we're going to look at is uh, sponging. So sponging is also this similar uh, part of cellular breathing, but it's a little more specific in looking at the, um, fluid exchange through a membrane. So if you imagine that in yourself, that you know, like we have our seaweed exercise, which is a fluid feeling the flow of the ocean moving through the membrane of the seaweed. And you can try that in yourself, that kind of uh, just flow, membrane flow, membrane flow, membrane flow. So there's also, one of the 
images there is the Marula, um, which is that early place in embryological development where the cells are multiplying and that they're, um, they're still in a contained space that the, the outer shell hasn't expanded. So you have more and more of this feeling of membranes. As you see in the picture, there's lots of people who are touching and moving together. So there's a sense of community, but also finding this balance of inner and outer and exchanging through that sense of community, but always still having this flow back and forth, back and forth. So you're kind of building, building this sense of the power of the fluid. And um, yeah, that's good. So is this, um, Margaret, uh, when we look at the pictures of Kumite, um, yep. We can we can do this kind of uh, feeling of uh, fluids entering and leaving our body uh, in in solo wakame, but actually when you do it with somebody else, you are no longer a single cell doing that, but uh, uh, but already the beginning of a community of cells where there's something more going on than just uh, an individual experience. You're building an experience together with somebody yeah. else or the group yeah. is that about right for sponging yeah yeah so you you begin to have the real exchange with your with the other mm -hmm. not just with yourself yeah. and how you and how you are connected and what yeah. does that feel like yeah i remember this particular kumite in in Haas. Um, uh, that we were all doing and uh, of course you have a direct experience with your partner it's very clear but also you, you kind of pick up an energy from the room of uh, other people's kumite going on um, around you yeah. as well which is a really interesting experience as well yeah that's kind of it also, all of this fluid movement has its own vibration. So you start, you also start picking up what's the, we're saying what's the feeling in the room, but it's really is what's that vibratory feeling in the room? Is, is it coming up? Is it coming down? Should I, do I want to get closer to that? <laughs> do I want to move away from that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the next one is about pulsation. Um, and this one has to do with this intensified rhythm of the fluid flow um, and relates a lot to our diaphragms. So and animal wise, it's the jellyfish. And um, like you can just start feeling that in your hands, just make that sort of pulsation feeling or feel it in the, your diaphragm, what's that? And these are things that we build on and rely on in Keiko, I think, this kind of, sometimes with gore, that sort of giving a pulsing um, gore rhythm to the counting. Um, what we're doing with our koshis, that kind of opening and condensing and opening and condensing. So forward and back and uh, opening and closing and finding the middle space, um, hopping together where we're unifying through our hopping, but also hopping through pulsating in a way, pulsating through our uh, centers. And um, the other interesting thing that I liked about this one is that we start getting a real sense of the rebound of kind of that there's um, beginnings of the, the beginnings of the periphery taking you into the middle and then there's a rebound energy that we can really start to utilize in our movements. Um, yeah. That's a really interesting way to think about jumping rather than the uh, rather than the effortfulness of it, which often 
our mind turns towards how am I going to get to the next jump uh, is, to, is to think about, well, actually, this is a pulsing rhythm. So if I carry on, gradually it will take me along with it. Right. And sometimes, like, can you find that rhythm? Mm. You know, rather than relying so much on our musculature, mm. it's like, oh, is there a way that I can just find, like, can sink into a rhythm mm. and let that guide me? And I think, you know, that's the aim of what we do sometimes is to unify everybody, find the rhythm, and then the room finds the rhythm, and that can carry it all. But, you know, sometimes it's not there for us individually. <laughs> so how do you find another way, I think? Or can this other way emerge as you start playing with fluids and membranes? Is there is that quality able to emerge and we're able to keep using it in our movements. And the, the next one that we have is uh, navel radiation. So this one is really more about the sense of having a center and that the movement is oriented from the center and you have limbs and all of the limbs are related through that center. Yet each limb can move um, individually or in combination with each other. But the first piece is really about each limb can move individually. And you can see that with the starfish that it has that uh, quality of well, this limb is doing that and this other limb is doing that. And um, we can have that freedom. You can, so I, I put that picture of the spider monkey because you get to really see every limb <laughs> relating through that you can have that uh, dexterity and freedom to go any which way you want to. Mm -hmm. In a human, we also in, initially it's shown with the, um, the baby in utero, where the umbilical cord comes into your navel and that that is your center for those nine months. So it's a very strong um, patterning in us that we can rely on. And in, you know, in, in Shintaido, we talk about the hara, which is, a, a, I think, a different thing than the navel, but it still is very close to what we're talking about. It's that a more energetic connection. Um, so often, Margaret, um, during Keiko, you know, these are familiar phrases that we hear is like, uh, uh, move from the center, move from your center, or enter into your partner's center. Um, and it's always being a little bit mysterious to me is what is this center, you know, where, but actually this makes it a little clearer that it's the, the source of energy in a person, the source of energy from me that's going to, um, if I can find it, my movement's going to be a lot freer because I'm not relying on the limbs. I can, I can push push everything out from the center and I can go into my partner's energetic world as well. It seems to me, but. Yeah, the, um, I mean, the other interesting thing about a starfish is that their mouth is in the middle. So it's on the underside, but so if you imagine that sense of, um, you know, my mouth is here <laughs> in my koshi and then I can take in and expand out from there that I can gather in and um, and reach out also. So we're, we're exploring a lot in our Keiko with this idea and that in all of our movements, if you, if this, if this pattern isn't very strong, it's hard to get all of the movements that we do because they all rely on this pattern of coming through the center and that each limb can work individually but also be connected through 
And sometimes when you have an injury, you can see, oh, <laughs> not connected yet. <laughs> um, or that in the practices that we do, that we develop this connection also. So, and you can see, we use it a lot in Shintaido. <laughs> All of our opening exercises, many of our opening exercises in Kaikyaku Show and Kaikyaku Dai are, are, are using um, this navel radiation, this ex, you know, connection through all the limbs and ability to move from our center. Um, let's see, what's the next one? Mouthing. Okay. Oh, this is for Terry. <laughs> I hope he caught it. <laughs> um, so developmentally, in terms of the animals who come into um, a sense of the mouth being the lead. So limb-wise, if we went back to the starfish, we would say that one of the limbs has become more important and the um, it's moved up and the anus has moved down. So now you've got a digestive tube and it's the mouth of that tube that is the lead. You still have this connection through the center and the limbs, but this becomes the important part. And, um, you know, it's really exemplified by a baby nursing where you see them, the, the mouth is always like <laughs> seeking, finding, reaching, taking hold of. Um, and that leads into our sense of um, excitement, um, expression, satisfaction. Um, you can see with the little jumping guy there who is just so excited and, you know, it's a natural response of, yeah. <laughs> and our dragon, um, you know, utilizing our mouth in Shintaido to both express, but to Blah. that connects all the way down through your tail. So you're beginning to get this soft connection from your, um, from your mouth to your anus, but a soft digestive tube. And think of the expression that comes with that of like, <laughs> and we also see um, how your mouth can be used to um, it's not control, but it initiates and can really help guide our movement. So that open mouth or um, one of the basketball players, whenever he would take a, a shoot the basketball, he always had his tongue out. He went, uh. <laughs> so that using your tongue to help modulate and guide you was part of this mouthing experience. And um, the mouth also is the mm, hub in a way of your face. So the mouth and your nose are these first of your senses that start helping you to orient yourself in, in the world. And, um, you know, it comes before hearing and it comes before your vision really comes in. Uh, so it's quite an important underlying um, factor, both in our expression and in how we are engaged. Yeah. And the next one of these is of the prevertebrates is the prespinal. So we've come from this sense of one cell doing this and gradually developing limbs and now we've got a center and then now we've got a tube and now we've got a digestive tube. And this one is about the um, a, another soft vertical axis that has to do with the notochord and the little fish that exemplified are these, um, are these little guys called the lancelets. And what was special about them was that they had a digestive tube and the notochord and then the nervous system. So you, you, 
there's still not a um, a spine, but they have a they have a a soft spine. So you have this quality like that of. Um, Margaret, can you explain notochord? Is is that a neural network? Is is that where the nerves run? What what is that? No, it's an embryological development, and the um, the notochord is the place that everything organizes around. All the growth organ organizes around the notochord, so it happens pretty early on, and. Um, body positions are all in, like every, all the information is related to the notochord. It's like, okay, this goes over here and this goes over here. So it becomes our central axis, okay. the early embryonic central axis. And um, eventually it just becomes the discs in our spine. Okay. But initially it's our, it's our early axis. Yeah. Thank you. So, remnants of that we have in this kind of wiggly spinal movement that you'll see babies do and um, sometimes a little bit when we're like shaking our bodies <laughs> you know you can experiment with all of these to see try all of these movements and try all of these fluid patterns and see which one brings you something different or something more fun um, it also has to do with developing this front back fluid rhythms that help us with our nervous system in the sense that uh, when we come into flexion, so more of, let's see, more of this quality mm -hmm. has to do with the parasympathetic and more of this quality has to do with the sympathetic. So uh engagement in the world engagement with yourself and what you're needing to attend to body wise spirit wise um this is the place where you can start to see it showing up and how we can kind of balance with that and we do we do a lot we do a lot there <laughs> yeah so feeling that kind of front and back on undulating soft spine. Yeah. I hope everyone's doing this because it's very pleasant. <laughs> you can you can just sit there and keep trying all of them and <laughs> go with it. Yeah. Okay. So the next part that we have is that we've developed um, a spine in the sense of a bony structure rather than um, uh, having these softer forms. And that kind of movement, um, we have a lot of flexion, flexion that we do in uh, ohm and extension that we open into ah, and the really extreme forms that we see with the shintaido jump. <laughs> But in the animal world, you'll see this with fish. They're all spinal movement. And uh, dolphins are um, more vertical, or I should say sagittal movement. But, um, and once you get on land, you see it with like the running cheetahs. Um, there's a, the reaching through their spine with their uh, senses and how that pulls them along and the balance through their tail all of that tensegrity through that whole spine um, is what you can see with that piece. Mm -hmm. And we, um, we use that a lot in Shintaido with uh, Om and Ah. So if you, if you put your hands on your head to feel the, just let your, let your head slightly come into flexion and let your head slightly come into, I don't wanna say extension, but just letting it lean back and doing that a little bit. So 
so this part um, birthing, we have a we have the back crown. So initially you're noodling with the back of your crown. And as you come down the birthing canal, the middle part of your head starts to open the space up. And then the front part of your head eventually allows you to reach through and open up through your spine. And meanwhile, all of that is happening as your feet are pushing on the walls, but it's also sending the impulse all the way. So your feet are gathering energy and extending and using that to come into your tail and use your spinal energy to help you come out through the world. Um, so it's a real, it's, a, it's really about feeling uh, this whole, this whole piece, so if you put your hand on your sacrum and put one hand on, on your head, so not at the back of your head, you wanna free your whole head to just come into flexion or come into extension. And flexion and extension. This is very interesting, Margaret. I've just realized uh, that the beginning of Tenching Oso from Un going into A uh, is exactly this form, isn't it? So it, it, it actually truly is a moment of birth because that's how we were, that's how we were born. We often think about plants rising up, you know, that's the image I've always had, but this is quite amazing to think that this is how I, how I was born as a human being to come from that yeah. into the pushing and reaching and leading with the head. That's quite extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. It's an, I think over the years, I've just experimented with different things, partly because you see what's going on in your own body. And then there's, oh, go to body mind centering class and go, oh, well, how does that feel in, in the form? <laughs> So it's been quite a quite something to keep exploring the same form, but with different aspects. Mm -hmm. And that one was very helpful to feel the whole head really free up and and not not imagine that it just comes from here, that I come up that way, that I come up that way. Mm -hmm. And it really feels the unfurling that you see in the, you know, uh, in a in a frond of fern or something like that. You feel the whole unfurling of us. Yeah. This one also is related to our Tenshi Jin feeling. So getting that connection. And then the next one is um, homologous. So once we have a spinal sense established, um, all the other pieces rely on that spinal sense to be as strong and integ integrated. And when it's not, then we tend to have trouble <laughs> with, our, with our limb patterns. So these next ones are all different limb patterns. And the first one is called homologous, which just means upper, uh, both arms go together or both legs go together. And you'll see that with the frogs hopping, um, meso jumping, <laughs> a lot of our kumites <laughs> coming into reaching for each other and the arms are doing something, the legs might be doing something different. Um, rent a coup jumping. They're um, how we relate initially, like reaching forward with our arms. Um, I'm saying relating initially, I'm meaning relating through our limbs initially, um, because throughout all the other ones, we're, all re we're always relating through touch mm -hmm. and gravity and fluids. Um, but this is where our limbs 
start coming into action. And so the first one is really this one of both, both hands or both legs. Mm -hmm. We work a lot with this in Shintaido. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we know that one. <laughs> Open hand, yeah. Kihon practices, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But certainly in the upper limbs, you know, like a dai, a dai jodan cutting or jodan cutting two hand. Doesn't have to be straight down the center, but it's both both hands together, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Moving. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So both both arms or both legs or are both doing the legs. same thing. So yeah, jumping is. Yeah, so a lot of the jumping that we do is has this homologous piece to it, and you can feel the difference uh, of the different states that you get into. So if you imagine that you're a spinal creature, which is often, you know, just just find that quality of your spine and then contrast that with <laughs> you know like I'm getting into both my legs and I'm getting into both my um, arms the the mind state is very different yeah so let's see then we have homolateral And that one is about sidedness. So either the right side's moving together or the left side is moving together. Um, and the salamander is the, um, where you'd really see it in the animal kingdom, that kind of. And the baby, it, this homolateral isn't something you see often as a pattern for the babies, but it's used to get to contralateral. So you have to have this sidedness before you can get to the diagonal movement. Mm -hmm. And we found some pictures. It wasn't so easy finding the pictures, but we found some. We, you know, homolateral, so sidedness and diagonal movement, they come together. Homolateral supports contralateral. So it's often in a transition of the movement that you'll see one side and then moving into the diagonal side. Um, so you can see it in the bow movement and in our Rinki Kumite and um, staff, any of the staff movements that we do often carries that homolateral piece to it. Mm. And I, I was also thinking about one of the, um, the hopping exercises, uh, not hopping, but one of the breakout exercises where you're kind of doing this. Yeah. The, um, those kind of movements are, you know, <clears throat> working with your koshi, but each side. Mm -hmm. So you can start to feel that um, moving from your center, but now each side of your center. And we mm -hmm. do have, you know, uh, two pelvic halves and they can move <laughs> independently. So it's a bit of working that, of giving you that ability to eventually come into that, that. So that really helps with reaching, doesn't it? That homolateral movement can propel you a lot further. So when we're doing tsuki and we step on the same side, we can go a really long way. And I guess yeah. from the martial point of view, if, you're, if you've got that ability to move on one side and, and turn, then you're, you can avoid uh, avoid a, 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 cut, a cut or a blow or something coming yeah. this way. So it's a very practical thing to be able to do, um, I guess, for animals as well. It's, uh... Yeah, yeah. And yet underneath it, you want to have had the spinal support so that your attention is there, that you can pivot this way, that way, through your spine. And the homologous is, um, I mean, the home, yeah, homologous is often more of a, not, you know, if you can use that push into the reach mm -hmm. and in homolateral, you really feel the push of a foot will take you into a reach. Same mm -hmm. thing with these people doing the Renki Kumite where there's a, a push of the lower body that travels all the way through. And once you reach the end of your fingertips, then 
either space pulls you further or you pull the rest of your body and go further with another step. But there's a real, um, really feeling of the forces traveling through your body into a yielding, reaching, uh, yielding, pushing, reaching, pulling in or being pulled out, which is a lot of what we're using in Shintaido, that part of getting, <laughs> reaching the end and then getting pulled further. So this is also a process of how we move through that. And then the last bit is the contralateral. So where you're, um, the movement is able to travel on a diagonal and it's the, you, you know, where we come into spiralic movement. Um, yeah, and you can see how dynamic it can be with this Shintaido picture of, do you know who that is, Ula? Uh, what, with the bow or which one, which picture? With the Bokto, the ones under the horse. Oh, under her horse. I do believe that that is Minagawa Sensei and I don't know who the other one is. They'll have to tell us at the end. <laughs> <I think. laughs> is it Ito Sensei? I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But one of the one of the highlights of the contralateral is about the reach. So this is really where you start reaching and that you're, it's the, it's the, the periphery, it's the ends of you that start taking you through and bring you further. So you've built up all this other tone from the other patterns, fluid tone, muscular tone. Um, and now you get to explore space and go further. So your perceptions are going further, your, um, uh, desire to be out in the world is uh, greatly increased. You can see that with the little baby. He's like, got to go there. <laughs> Thank you, Cyril, for explaining. It was Okada and Ita. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Ito Yoshitaka with the bow. And um, I think. Uh, Anything in Shintaido that has that gyaku uh, quality would bring you into contralateral. We're, we do a lot of going back and forth from homolateral into contralateral. But the, you know, any, all, all of the animals, all of the mammals usually are in that reaching and pulling through the, through their limbs to bring you into um, that pattern of mobility. Which, um, you know, it's higher up in your brain. So each of these patterns has a, a way of building your brain also. You're building your neurology going through all of these different movement patterns and um, you're building your responses, your ability to respond to different factors in the world and um, at this level, there's such great expressiveness and curiosity and real, you're really starting to come up into your higher part of your brain that has to do with imagination and conceiving ideas um, and how to put them into action. So um, going, going through all the patterns is how we are building ourselves also that they're not just a, a static pattern of, oh, you should do this or you should do that. It's like, no, this is how we, this is how we emerge really and come into our full fullness. I, I'm minded that uh, we have a lot of stepping practices in Chikaido that start off very simply, you know, yep. Musubidachi, musubidachi, step number one, coming forward and then coming back. And then we gradually extend it to one side and then we end up stepping over and then yeah. we turn. And it seems like this is also a similar kind of pattern of, you know, you have to be able to do this first and then you end up doing the other, the other things. Um, Minagawa Sensei is always very encouraging to us. And he says, if you feel really unbalanced and you don't feel that it's working right, that's when you're learning. 
So this is a yeah. really good place to be. It's don't worry about feeling that you're rubbish and you're falling over because now you're learning, your body's learning. Yeah. So it it seems to follow on from what you've said that, you know, it's your brain's trying to integrate these kind yeah. of complex movements. Yeah. And also, it's like sometimes I think you can see somebody who can't hop on two feet or you can't hop on two feet and you go, well, what's going on? Mm. Or a particular, a particular movement is really challenging. It's like, oh, I got it really good on my right side, but what happened over on the left? <laughs> so um, I often will go back to two different patterns to see in myself, well, what, what's the hookup mm -hmm. to just do them over and over again? or um, find out where's the, where's the glitch in the, um, in the execution. Mm. It's like, oh, that, didn't, that doesn't actually travel either through my brain or my brain body. So, you know, for Bonnie, it was about body-mind, not mind-body, that um, your cells themselves have to have the experience first before they can engage. So is to go back and perhaps find a way to give them more of that cellular experience to then connect in with the whole. Um, that's how I've used it in Shantaido mm -hmm. is to try and find the places where I feel the, oh, big glitch there or a oh, little glitch there, but still a glitch, you know, yeah. and how to, how to work on it. Yeah. I thought what we could do is just look at one of these patterns and the one that I was choosing was the navel radiation because I feel like it's often, um, it's just so underneath all the, a lot of what we do. And um, so this first picture, um, Right in the middle is one that shows you all the different ways that this starfish can move. So each of you can see that they can either all stay open or all kind of gather, or they can start to be um, moving individually and have different relationships through their center. And the, the part that was so interesting to me was that there's the center and then you really start to feel the periphery. So it's the periphery for us that's gonna take us into a reach into the world. Um, and if you look at the pictures of the tubules, you can see that it's got these little tiny, all these little tiny tubes on the tips that allow it to move and keep walking or to reach out to another. So you have this kind of connection, like what's going on? What's going on in space? Who are you? What's going on in my world? So if you take a minute to just feel that sense of the tubules moving and waking up that whole sense of your, um, of your, of your arm having this kind of sensitivity and mobility to take you into the world or to bring something back into your world. And there's a few images also of the, um, of the starfish eating a clam. So what they do is they take their whole, they take their center has the mouth and it comes out and it takes hold of that, but then they also drape each of their limbs over the, over the clam or whatever they're eating and use their little tubules to open it up and extract it. So here we have this sense of coming into your center and opening out and coming in and then opening out and then coming in and let yourself just stay in for a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
And when you're ready to come out, use your little tubules to gradually open up a little bit. And you can use those little tubules to maybe come to touching something in the room or next to you on the table. And it can bring you or you can just explore it. So it'll either bring your whole limb forward and stay connected to your center or you can bring that back to yourself, to your center. And Peter, if we can show the other one. Yeah. So underneath all of our Shintaido, a lot of our Shintaido movements um, is this navel radiation. And there's just a little preview of many of the things that we do with this sense of connection through our through our navel and connection through our limbs. So I'd suggest let's do um, let's just do a little om, bringing all of your limbs and gathering them into the center. And then using that sense of the navel and the periphery and opening all the way out into awe. Uh, and then when you're ready, coming back into Om. Gathering in again. And maybe you can explore that feeling of naval radiation um, throughout your next, uh, your next time of doing Shintaido. So thank you very much, Margaret. That was really interesting um, exploration of body mind centering in Shintaido side by side. And it makes me think about this message of the universe um, and kind of helped me to understand that actually that progression of movement is part of the evolution and the development of life. And those forms yeah. of movement exist all around us. It's not that one's finished, we're done with it now. We're going on to the higher one with our brain leading the way. Actually, we need to integrate all of those elements of the movement into our Shintaido practice for it to be unified. So it, it, yeah. For me, it was a light bulb moment. It was like, oh, yes. So this is the message. And this is unification. That that made sense to me. I don't know if everyone will agree with me, but that's that's how I, I took it to mean. And, and the other phrase that we hear very often that I know that has when I was starting was that we were encouraged to develop natural movement. It was going to be rather than stiff or stilted. You know, this is through the medium of martial arts, of course, but that our movement should be natural. And looking at all of that homologous and homolateral movement and the reaching and the stretching and allowing the spine to to move naturally uh, seemed make a lot of sense to me now so yeah uh, another thing i would say about natural movement is um i think Alki at that point was referencing a baby's movement mm. and you know that they, they're 
muscles and their skeleton aren't so strongly developed yet. So their movement, what you really feel is a lot of this fluid power that they have of, um, yeah, it's fluid. It's not so much about, oh, I'm engaging my muscles to do this uh, movement pattern. They're, they're just working through all of that early stuff and it's still quite strong and present in them. Mm -hmm. And um, I think many of our exercises work at developing that quality also. Mm -hmm. It's um, bringing, helping to come back to the fluid, our fluid nature. You know, where a lot of um, membranes and fluid and membranes and fluid and membranes and fluid, it's just that combination might be a muscle. <laughs> so it's to keep accessing this fluid, fluid nature of ourselves that can also bring out more of that natural body movement along with this organization, because it does have an organization. And then you let it go, you know, there's that part. Just <laughs> don't get too caught, but use it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Ulla. Thank you. I would just like to say, uh, I found working with Margaret over the last few weeks has been really inspirational in understanding what we're doing in Shintaido. And uh, it's really made me appreciate the genius of Aki-sensei to have discovered through these movements the entire history of, uh, of, of the evolution of life really and that and that he's created a, a form or perhaps everybody here together with him has created a form of, uh, of Keiko in which we are managing to explore the whole of the um, evolution of life from the beginning of the universe really right through life and, uh, and up to the present and it just seems remarkable and for for years I wondered what this body is the message of the universe um, slogan means it used to have a bumper sticker and um, people used to ask what it meant and I would stutter vaguely I don't know really what it means but uh, um, but I think I now really get a sense of it so I want to say thank you very much Margaret I think it's fascinating oh, you're welcome Peter yeah I was I was sitting down and writing just about that idea. And I, I was like, well, I could read it a couple of ways. The body is the message of the universe. The body is the message of the universe. And the body is the message of the universe. <laughs> I think it was the last one that I was like, that's the one I have most uh, relationship with. Just that the universe. We're, we're not separate. I guess that was it. We're just not separate. We are part of the universe. So uh, I think Charles has a question for you. Yeah. I was just wondering <clears throat> where this categorization of all these different movements, you seem to have created, um, there seems to be every single kind of movement we can make with our bodies has somehow been categorized into one of these uh, different types that you've described today. And I just wondered where this categorization came from. So I'd say the, um, the vertebrae patterns, the spinal, the homologous, homolateral, contralateral, that's, Bonnie was an occupational therapist or is an occupational therapist. So she has that background. It wasn't um, anything she particularly made up. Um, and the other things are things that she started exploring uh, in her life. Um, seeing the relationship with naval radiation when she had her, her children. Um, each of these things came on at different points throughout the, um, the development of body-mind centering. Some of it was uh, students also. Um, as the, as the work had a, has a, um, I'm gonna say a community component where Bonnie will have some sense of something and will have worked on it for a while. And then when you bring it into the community classes, there are some 
feedback coming. And so some of the students also said, well, what about sponging? And what about pulsation? Um, so that is the, the way it, it kind of evolved. It wasn't in a linear way. Um, yeah, but it happened over 50 years. It was that kind of um, process. And Bonnie is the, um, she's the originator of body-mind centering. And that was her, it, you know, this is one of the templates, I would say that in, in talking about our human experience, there's certainly other ones like working through the fluids or working through the body systems, like the, the glands or the hormones. And, but this was one that I felt like related to our question of <laughs> the body is a message of the universe. I was wondering if you could tell us more about uh, the reason why you asked the question, are we listening the message? <laughs> well, we, we were having a conversation, Pierre, uh, the three of us, Peter, uh, Margaret and myself, and suddenly we thought, wow, this is, it, we were talking about body mind centering and the different forms. And we thought, wow, this is the, this is the message of the universe. But actually, mostly we don't, we're, we're stuck in our brain, you know, uh, so we're, we, we like to intellectualize movement sometimes. And, and the message comes through our body. It doesn't always, we can think about it, we're talking about it now, but actually it's the practicing of it um, that is, is how you receive the message. It's receiving it through the body. So I guess that was the, the question that, that one of the questions we, we came up with a number of them is body is the message of the universe. Are you listening? How are you listening? Uh, how are we receiving? You know, we had all of the, it's the same kind of question, really, mm. isn't it, Margaret, that, that we came what up with? What is the message? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Sometimes we, yeah, we, we believe more in the kata than in the body. Yeah. That's true. Yes, I, I was thinking of, um, you know, the, 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 more, the more basic forms of life you know the, the amoeba and the the, the tubular um, creatures and then the starfish and so on i was thinking of that as um still part as you say parts of ourselves parts we're still part of that and and each one sort of transcends to the to the next and then you were talking about pre pre-vertebrate and then vertebrate. And I was thinking about the, the, um, the, the sense of ossification as, as, we, as we go through life and, and you know, as, we, as we get older, we get you know, stiffer and so on. So in order to, to, be, you know, to, to achieve more fluidity, we, we need to have, we need to sort of go back to that, you know, that reconnection to, to those earlier parts of ourselves and 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 that's not just bodily that's in the mind as well I, that that's what I found really fascinating in, in your piece it was lovely I I use these patterns uh sometimes uh you know like I I was really nervous about this workshop not workshop but presentation and I could feel my energies coming up. And I was like, well, which pattern is going to be helpful here? <laughs> so I went to, it's like, oh, you're, this sense of membranes, my membranes are tight and the fluids are not moving through. Mm. So I just kept um, going back and forth. Whenever that came up, it was just, find the flow. So part of it is a meditation, but also it had a real physiological effect. And um, yeah, I just appreciate- like To draw the breath down to the diaphragm, we, we often feel less anxious, don't we? You know, bring yeah. the breath down. Yeah. 
and, and into the belly and so on. So, yeah. And for me, it was about finding just fluids. It's mm. let it go back and forth. Stop trying to fix it. Let it go back and forth, you know, yes. and just like in what we do in seaweed exercise, you know, so yeah. finding that quality. Lovely. Thank you. Um, thank you. Susan. Okay, so Heather, um, I'm, this is my voice. So the question for Margaret is, uh, what developmental stages or stage or stages are you working on in your body at this stage uh, in your life or maybe uh, related to the pandemic uh, related suffering? Thanks, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> I would say um, I, I am working a lot with the fluid patterns for myself. Um, and just as I was expressing to uh, Sally, that it was being able to find the fluidity in the mix of all of this change, so much change going on. And it's hasn't felt a lot like it's about going forward strongly or reaching out strongly. It's really been about, for me, um, kind of reorganizing my fluid structures and that I have accessibility to that at all times. And looking at the fluid patterns going, uh, I like navel radiation for this center and periphery because that's often a place that I've been mixed up in my body mind was like, Oh, not quite a center, not quite a periphery. How do you, how do I develop that? And how do I um, come into relationship with that? Instead of having everything be either central or every, for me, this was everything being very central or everything being peripheral. P peripheral meaning, oh, of no consequence. I was like, well, that's not true. So having to learn these things for myself and how to distinguish that in these days also and learn to let, it, let, let go of things or just say, oh no, you're in the peripheral category. You're, you don't need to be in the central category. Hmm. So I can, when you, when you, when you mentioned the <laughs> uh, naval radiation, uh, I noticed, I noticed my nervous system really, really calm calm itself um and that makes sense to me so i'm wondering how do you how can keiko support what you're working with in terms of flu the, your fluid body and naval radiation like how does how does how does how does that practice intersect with your with your shintaido practice and how you show up or how you lead or, yeah. Well, I've had a hard time trying to incorporate the sort of exploration I would do, like a, a somatic exploration in Keiko. So I have to do that on my own and then bring that piece into class. Um, On the other hand, I'm experimenting with how can I just add a drop of that idea into teaching so that it's not, I, I can carry the information. Like we all do, we all carry it. But when you embody it, it gets transmitted. It's not that you have to verbally uh, say it. It can be, it's that energetic transmission of if I'm, if I'm in a naval radiation place, then you'll see it in my body or you won't see it in my body. But it's about how, you know, how we, we do this in Keiko. You know, we say, go to Yokike, you have to go to Yokike. You have to find that sense in yourself or go to Kaihoke. There, I went to Kaihoke. <laughs> so again, it's how do I, 
how do I explore it enough on my own that I can carry it into the class? Very interesting to hear all your cosmic uh, movements. <laughs> um, I uh, consider the um, instrument I play a very central part of my life, which is the shakuhachi. Um, but, well, no buts. Um, in remaining centered, uh, as you obviously do in your work. Um, do you have any movements for the solar plexus? Because the, the heart, the solar plexus is the one organ that goes beyond the body. And I wondered if that comes into your movements. If we started to look at the glands, um, there are some movements that we could do related to that. So lying on the floor um, and asking your, um, your xiphoid process to kind of come, ah, I <laughs> it's a little hard to explain, but there are some, uh, and they have to do with these energetic centers also. So not just a uh, physical um, movement that way, but it's an energetic center that will allow an opening to happen in your diaphragm and solar plexus. And again, connecting through each of your limbs. So it's a, rather than a muscular support, you really start to feel all of this energetic connection through that allows you to do that movement easily. Um, so that's, that's one. There's also another aspect of a kind of unified breathing that there's a, you can think of your insides as a whole diaphragm from here all the way through to your um, pelvic floor and using that as a, um, as a way to breathe differently but also organize your body differently and it's not quite related to the solar plexus that way, but it is related to the breathing and the energetics of that system. For me, it's, it's, it's more a sense of, um, you know, feeling. I, I sort of live more in the feeling than my head, I think. And um, when I saw the title, the body is a message of the universe. So, well, okay. Of course it is, you know. <laughs> this, you know, you can see it in plants, you can see it in other people, you can see it in the universe, you can see the whole connection. Uh, but but my um, uh, for me it's becoming more aware of it. And I'm I'm recently new to Shintado, uh, but I I found um affinity with it straight away because of the movements and I could see how it connects. Um, I don't know whether I got a question. It's, it's just the, um, it's really nice to listen to you because it's, it's becoming aware of it and giving it names and um, uh, yeah. Yeah. So thank you for that. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Yeah. And I have to say, for my learning, it was also helpful to have names. Yeah, yeah. And to have a, a, I keep calling it a template, but because at this point it is a template, it's not a fixed thing. And who knows what else will be added to it. But I have appreciated it a lot. <laughs> uh, I would like to just say thank Margaret very, very much for a this wonderful presentation and it's been so enlightening and um, just completely revivifying my sense of the Keiko. So just to say on, on Friday this week, uh, we had the strongest storm, the strongest winds for, for, for many decades. Um, and I went out in the park and I did Takimai in the wind 
and uh, and I felt exactly like a lancelet. You know, those little little creatures that we saw in the, uh, then never heard of a lancelet before, and now I know that I can be one with the, with a noto chord, and uh, <laughs> and uh, can and just discover so many new dimensions in our in our movement that uh, that I've, I've learned from this. So I really really appreciated it. I'm sure everybody else has. So thank you very much, Margaret. That was even better than we were hoping it would be. And uh, let's say thank you to everybody. Say thank you to Margaret and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter and Ula. Thank, thank you, Margaret. My partners. Thank you, Margaret. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Lovely. Thank you, everyone, for your comments and questions. Yes. It's been very interesting to listen to everyone.